everybody. Good morning. This is Christine and Emily. And what's your name? Palmer. Palmer is saying good morning from Columbus, Mississippi. Emily, what do you want to tell everybody? Welcome to church. We hope you all have had a wonderful week and enjoy the service today. We hope that if you have children, you have also enjoyed the at-home VBS activities this week. And we look forward to catching y'all online this morning. Bye. Well, good morning. Uh, happy last Sunday in July, uh, or happy last week in July, depending on when you watch this. Uh, Praise Jesus, we've made it through July fairly unscathed so far. Um, but, you know, everything is still kind of happening. And who knows what's going to happen next week? Because uh, it's 2020 and Murphy's Law has just kind of come this year and camped out in, in all of our lives. Um, and we have a great Sunday uh, coming up. And I'm really excited about what we're going to talk about today. And I'm even more excited about what we're going to talk about next week. Uh, I'm going to have a conversation with uh, one of my friends. I suppose you can call her a friend. Um, she's a really awesome individual. And uh, we're going to actually meet on Tuesday this week. And she and I are going to have a conversation about guilt, shame, and forgiveness. Uh, so that'll be maybe next week and maybe even the next two Sundays, depending on how long the conversation goes. So uh, you won't want to miss the next two weeks because I guarantee uh, she is going to drop some incredible knowledge uh, and just different perspectives. And will kind of give all of us, myself included, just some different ways about thinking about us, uh, who we are, uh, our faith walk uh, that all kind of surrounds this idea of overcoming, uh, kind of breaking through the walls of guilt, shame, and then ultimately uh, getting into an area of not only forgiving ourselves but forgiving other people uh, and ultimately maybe even forgiving God. Um, I know that sounds kind of weird, but we're going to get into some of that too. So uh, you won't want to miss the next couple weeks because I think they're going to be really, really uh, good and hopefully maybe even a little life changing. So, but until we get there, I got a couple of announcements for you. So this Wednesday, so starting this Wednesday at 10 a.m., uh, we're going to have a Zoom coffee hour. So if you have missed seeing some people that you usually uh, connect with on Sunday mornings or even throughout the week, um, come on Wednesday morning. Uh, we can send you the Zoom link if you're interested to shoot us a message and we will get that to you. And you can drink your coffee at 10 o'clock in the morning and just enjoy some conversations with other people on the Zoom chat. So uh, 10 a.m. this Wednesday, we have a Zoom coffee hour. So this week has been VBS and hopefully we've had some kids that have been really enjoying uh, kind of the activities at home. Hopefully some families have been enjoying uh, that as well. If you've been doing that and you want to send in some pictures, we would love to kind of show them uh, on our social media channels and maybe even uh, a video uh, within this platform um, if we get enough uh, pictures. Uh, but if you uh, haven't done VBS and are still interested and don't have a packet, I think Cindy still has some that she'd be willing to, to get to you somehow. Um, in fact, she just sent a couple out later this later on from this week. So uh, that is still possible. So if you've not done it and you would like to with your own family, uh, just let us know and we'll get that information out to you. So starting in September, uh, there's five Tuesdays in September. Uh, we're going to start a five-week Bible study. I'm going to kind of be leading this. It is called uh, The Faith Heroes of the Old Testament. And it's going to be a women's Bible study. So not that I don't like men, um, but you're not invited to this one. Sorry. Um, what we might do one in the future where we can have all people involved. But uh, for at least this one, it's a five-week study uh, starting the first Tuesday in September. Um, again, the faithful the heroes of the Old Testament, and we're going to hear from five women, uh, Priscilla Shire, Kelly Minter, Beth Moore, Jennifer Rothschild, and Lisa Harper throughout the study. Uh, so if you're interested, shoot me a message and I will send you the link to the book that you're going to need. Um, and then we'll have the, the Zoom session up and we'll watch the video and then we'll discuss, uh, kind of work through the book as we go. So I hope you're looking excited or looking forward to that because I'm really excited about it. I've done uh, bits and pieces already so far and it seems really, really good. So be on the lookout for that information. And again, if you're interested, just shoot me a message. All right, the final announcement uh, that I have is there is a new uh, coffee shop in Fairborn that's going to be opening up on August 1st. So Saturday, August 1st is their grand opening at 11 a.m. And the coffee shop is called Cold or 555 Rivers Cold Brew. And so they're going to be selling cold brew coffee and it's, it's on Broad Street. 
Um, and I can get you the address for it if you're interested in attending that. But they are two of the nicest people. Their names are James, James and Lynn Mowry. And they uh, have just done an amazing job with their facility that they're in. And their coffee tastes incredible. Uh, if you're a coffee fan, um, you will want to try this cold brew coffee because it will knock your socks off. It's so good. So I want to encourage you to continue to be for a Fairborn and go and support this new local business. Uh, if you're not from Fairborn and if you're not uh, anywhere near our area, here's what I want you to do. I want you to find a local uh, business and sometime this week, sometime this weekend, I want you to go support them and be for them, uh, especially during this time as, as businesses are still kind of coming out of the the whole COVID issue. Um, so be for one of your local businesses this week, especially. And if you're in a Fairborn, I encourage you to go to 55 Rivers Cold Brew. It's on Broad Street. And again, I'll put up the address uh, so you can have it. Um, and be for Fairborn and for them and go get some amazing coffee on August 1st at about 11 o'clock. So that's all the announcements I have. So I hope you're ready. It's gonna be a good Sunday morning. So get your coffee, get comfy and get some snacks. And here we go. of our Fully You Sermon Series. This is kind of one of the longer series we've done in a while, and I, I've been enjoying it and hope you uh, have as well and have been able to get some things out of it. Uh, so last week we talked about pride and how pride can kind of get in the way of us living uh, life to the fullest and really moving beyond the wall that is before us. And, and the week before that, we looked at distractions and how uh, distractions can, can really get in the way of a lot of things in our life and really prevent us from seeing the whole picture and allow us to, again, continue to move forward in our journey. Uh, so today we're gonna take a look at kind of another section of our uh, invisible wall, or proverbial wall. Uh, and it, this section uh, is gonna cause us to kind of dig deep in order to be who we truly are and in order to really move forward uh, and kind of break down this part of the wall. So I got some questions for you. Have you ever been afraid of something? Now, to be honest, the answer is yes. I mean, there there's not a person on the planet that probably hasn't been afraid of something. We've all faced fear at some point in our lives. It starts early when we're kids, you know, uh, there's the fear of learning how to walk, even though we may not remember it, it was there. Fear of, you know, learning how to ride our bike just with two wheels. Fear of going down the really, really big slide, you know, the old metal ones that um, you pretty much got fried on your way down during the summer. You know, or maybe even your parents had the fear of kind of what was going to happen to you when you were kids. You know, the, the fear of sending you off to the, to the big sleepover or, you know, just, just fear of you getting hurt all the time. But then there's the fear of school, you know, especially this year. What is school even going to look like? You know, we signed our kids up for the digital uh, option for school this year. And what's that going to look like for them? And so there's a whole different fear, you know, about that. What are classes going to look like? Are we going to be able to interact with people and have friends? How is that going to look this year? You know, and then there's the teacher side, you know, what is it going to look like to have to teach with masks on all day long and to try to get the attention of kids when, when they can't physically see us talking? So a lot of different fears. You know, as an adult, we face additional fears, right? I mean, COVID has been a continual fear this entire year of 2020. You know, we have fears of finding a job, maybe keeping a job, having adult responsibilities, fears that come away or uh, that come with moving away from home or moving into a home. Familiar surroundings, you know, fears of marriage. I mean, they, they call it getting cold feet for a reason, right? And then we have those fears of living without a loved one. Fears of maybe growing old, but with grace. Having to kind of accept that we can't do things the way that we used to do them when we were younger. Maybe even fears of retirement. You know, what are we going to do now with all of our time? And then we have the ever-present fear of death. And you see, we all at some point in our life will face a fear of some kind. We do every single day. It's just sometimes our fears seem bigger than others. 
And, and a lot of times we always see fear as a bad thing and something that we, we kind of got to get rid of in our life. And our first response when in the midst of a fearful situation is to retreat as fast as we can. It's that fight or flight scenario, right? And often when it's a scary situation, we flee in the complete opposite direction so fast that we kind of leave that puff of smoke behind us, right? But fear isn't necessarily a bad thing. Now, it can be, so don't get me wrong. But fear in our life can either be an enemy that we permit to shackle us and control our every move. And it can be something that prevents us from ever doing anything in life, leaving us bound to our homes, never wanting to face the world. Or fear can be an ally that leads us and empowers us towards you know, living a life of fulfillment with lots of courage, lots of bravery, and the ability to conquer new challenges when we come face to face with them. You see, Fear tends to make our access to the courage inside of us even stronger. I'll say that again. Fear tends to make our access to the courage that is inside of us even stronger. And we want so bad to remove all the fear from our lives, but the reality is without fear, we would have no need to be courageous and no need to be brave. So therein kind of lies this paradox that where fear is, bravery and courage are waiting right around the corner. We can't have fear without courage and bravery. And we can't have those brave and courageous moments in life without that initial moment of fear. You see, they go kind of hand in hand because in order to be courageous, it requires us to overcome some type of fear. And on the flip side, fear then prompts us into action, action that either leads to us remaining where we are, being shackled by it, or an action that leads us to find the courage and the inner chutzpah to overcome. So fear and courage are, and fear and bravery are kind of what I like to call frenemies. They're friend and enemies at the same time. So this morning, we are going to look at the story of Esther. Now, not quite the whole story, so don't worry. It is a long one. But we're going to look at enough of it that will kind of give us a good idea of what type of queen Esther was. And it's going to give us a good idea of how she turned this huge fear of this giant wall before her into one of the most courageous moments of her life. So a brief recap of kind of what's happened so far in the story of Esther before we get to the main section for this morning. So Esther was made queen of Persia after the king, King Xerxes, kicked then Queen Vashti out of the kingdom because she wouldn't leave her 31 party and go to his toga party with his friends. After some time with no queen in the palace, the king kind of got lonely and his wise counsel advised him that he should put out a search in the kingdom, all 127 provinces, for the most beautiful young woman to be his queen. Now, Esther, who lived in the province, province of Susa, was selected to be one of the women taken to the palace for basically the biblical version of The Bachelor. Now, Esther isn't of Persian descent, though. She is a Jewish living in Persia because her family was exiled from Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. Her parents have died and she's living with her cousin Mordecai, who was given the task of raising her. Mordecai informs Esther when she is taken to not reveal her identity for multiple reasons, one of which was to keep her safe. And after spending time at the spa every day, Esther has her shot to win the final rose from the king. And she spends a night with him. And the king finds her absolutely breathtaking and even more beautiful than any of the other women that he has seen and been with. And the king gives her the final rose and puts the crown of the queen on her head. So Esther is now queen and life is really not too bad at this point. But then one day Mordecai is working his shift at the king's gate and he overhears two men plot to kill the king. So Mordecai informs his cousin Esther and she tells the king and the king does some fact checking and comes to find out that there were these two men who wanted to kill him. And so the king takes care of them. And for some reason, Haman, one of the king's men, is credited with his life-saving information and is celebrated for finding the knowledge, right? 
rather than Mordecai. Haman is given a new position in the kingdom and the king has ordered that all who see Haman need to bow. Now, if there were kind of music going on in the background, we would be at the slowly increasing dramatic musical score moment. So Haman one day was riding through the king's court and comes to the king's gate. And all those standing guard are ordered to bow and all of them ex do except one man, Mordecai. And this is where the music, the kind of the dum da dum 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 type of music will kind of hit. And Haman brushes it off at this time, but day after day, Mordecai is ordered to bow and day after day, he does not. Mordecai refuses to bow to Haman. Until one day, Haman asks him why, and Mordecai's response is to tell the men he is Jewish. And this infuriates Haman so much that he goes to the king and asks permission for an edict to be made. The king agrees, although he doesn't really know what he's agreeing to, just that he knows there are people causing issues within the kingdom and Haman wanted to remedy the situation. So Haman takes this freedom and puts, put, puts forth, there we go, puts forth an edict that in the 12th month, all the Jews in the entire land of Persia would be annihilated and all their goods plundered. Now, side note, there is more history to this as Haman is an Amalekite and Mordecai was an Israelite. The Amalekites and the Israelites, they didn't exactly get along. And if you want to read more about that, that's in Exodus uh, chapter 17. So meanwhile, back at the ranch, the queen is rather oblivious as to what is happening on the outside. She is living far from where her cousin is at. But she hears something has troubled Mordecai, and so she goes to him to find out why. She sends one of her attendants to Mordecai, and he sends her back this message about what has happened with Haman and the edict that is forthcoming. And in his closing statement, Mordecai begs Esther to go to the king for mercy and to plead with the king for their people. So this is where we pick up our story this morning. Esther 4, verses 9 through 11. So Hathach went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned. The king has but one law, that they be put to death, unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. You see, one had to have permission to go to the king, even the queen. She, she wasn't exempt from this kind of law. She wasn't given preferential treatment. And even though they were married, it wasn't you know, kind of like how we think a marriage is. It's not like they were exactly the closest of uh, spouses. I mean, he had a harem of other women, for goodness sakes. You know, and another thing we got to keep in mind is she hadn't been called to go to the king for 30 days. We don't, we don't know why he hadn't called her or summoned her for 30 days, but she hadn't been summoned to do so. And so to go is to risk her life and to, to be killed prematurely. And we got to think about the bigger perspective too. I mean, the last queen who, who was there, she was kicked out of the kingdom for merely telling the king no, she didn't want to go to his party. I mean, so all these things are probably swirling around Esther's mind at this moment of, you know, why would I want to leave this, this life? I mean, and so her fears of going to the king and, and responding to what her cousin wanted her to do, I mean, they were warranted and they were understandable. She didn't want to die. And I don't blame her. I wouldn't want to die either. I mean, let me just ask you, uh, ladies, I mean, guys, if you want to answer this too, you can, but would you want to be a queen? I mean, she's living the life. I mean, people wait on her hand and foot. She, she's got, you know, servants to kind of fan her when she's hot, give her grapes without having, you know, pull them off the stem and her bed has like the best pillows known to man. It's like sleeping on a cloud. She's got pools, she's got spa treatments. I mean, who would want to give that up? And so the temptation for her just to remain in that spot of, eh, this is not my problem, cousin. I wasn't the one who didn't bow to Haman. I mean, this is kind of all you're doing. And so the temptation is real for her to just flee and not fight this. You know, and in the same spot, we would probably be tempted to just kind of hold our ground and not do anything. 
you know, the voice is whispering to us, ignore this, just turn around and walk away. No one's going to know if you don't fight. It's okay. This isn't your problem. This isn't your mess to deal with anyway. And so, you know, we try to reason ourselves out of uh, situations that often cause us fear, that often cause us to hesitate and think, you know what? Someone else is better suited for this than I am. And then those questions of fears about what if, they tend to kind of creep in. I mean, what if this ends badly? What if my reputation is ruined? What if, what if people don't like me anymore? What if something bad happens? What, what if I fail? What if people laugh at me? Or worse, what if they never speak to me again because of this? And, and what if I go ahead with this and, and... No, I'm not going to do it. It's just way too risky. You see, at this moment is a moment that I think we all have been in various parts of our life. You know, we're standing at the wall that is before us and we see all these different fears that are, that are thrown at us. And we just want to take a step back and say, uh-uh, I don't want to face this. I'm going to stay here. Or I'm going to go the other way. And at this moment, Esther's fear of the what if and the unknown is greater than her confidence in God's power to do something. I'll say that again. At this moment, Esther's fear, and at those moments in our life, the fear of the what if and the unknown is greater than our confidence in God's strength and power. So Esther tells her cousin, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do what you ask. The risk is too great for me. And, you know, it's as if Mordecai kind of knew this temptation to sit back and not do anything was kind of surrounding Esther at this moment. It's kind of as if he sensed that she might say something like this. So he, he sends this message back to her, and, and it's a message that I'm, I'm sure many of us have, have probably heard at some point in our life. He says these words. He says, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. So Esther, she can't shake her cousin's words. She keeps hearing them kind of on repeat over and over she keeps hearing her cousin say, do not think that just because you're the queen, you will escape this plan. You are first and foremost Jewish. And this will indeed come to light, cousin. And if you don't do something about what's going to happen, I promise you somebody else will. This is bigger than us, Esther. But if you say nothing, if you do nothing, your safety cannot be guaranteed because God is going to find another way, another person who is willing to help and stop this from happening. And I love his final words because it's kind of like a, you know, a dig or just kind of a small jab in the back. He says to his high and mighty queenly cousin, and who knows, Esther? Who knows but that you have come to royal to your royal position for such a time as this? Who knows but that you were put in this position because you, Esther, have the ability to overcome your fear and knock through that wall and do what is right? Esther tried as hard as she could to just let this go, but she just couldn't hold it back anymore. So there she stood, maybe in the middle of the day and sent back word to her cousin of her intentions. She said, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So this is quite the turn of events from earlier in the conversation. I mean, we aren't sure how long it was from the initial message that her cousin gave her to this final one that she sent back. 
but it was long enough for multiple messages to go back and forth from the city courtyard to the queen's living quarters. However, we do know that it wasn't too long because there was this sense of urgency in Mordecai's message. He couldn't exactly wait for Esther to take days, weeks, or even months to decide what her plan was. And something changed in Esther as well. Maybe she kind of weighed the pros and the cons of the situation. Maybe she realized that either way, death was maybe inevitable. And so why not die fighting for something and someone else rather than dying while doing nothing? Maybe she soaked in, like deep in her soul soaked in the words that maybe, maybe God had put her in this position for such a time as this. So whatever happened in those moments, what we do know is Esther rose above her fear, all of her fear, and found the courage to go to the king. And this is a significant moment for the queen. Because rather than turning a blind eye to the situation, she rose above it. Rather than ignoring what was happening, she faced it head on. Rather than keeping quiet and blissfully going about her life, she stood up not only for herself, but for all of Israel in the process. Esther found the courage to do the extraordinary in the middle of one of the greatest, probably the greatest fear that she ever faced. I love this thought from John Wayne. Yes, I am quoting John Wayne, a cowboy. But he put it like this. He said, courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. And so Esther fit that description. She's scared to death, and yet she jumped on a horse and rode it straight to the king's court. So how in the midst of our lives can we show the same amount of courage so i don't i don't know what scares you I, I don't know what those moments are for you that you are walking along your journey and then out of nowhere that fear wall hits and you can't get beyond it i, I don't know what those are for you i know what they are for me and what i do know also is that we all have fears that can end up controlling us or setting us free towards living a life that is full and one that is filled with bravery and courage. So in order to live into being fully you, we cannot allow fear to control our lives and make decisions for us. You and I were not created to live in fear. We were not designed to let such a thing dictate our daily actions. We were created to overcome. We were created to be brave. We were created to be courageous. And we can do this. So I just finished a book called Untamed. It's by a woman named Glennon Doyle. Uh, it is a fantastic book. I would encourage you to read it. Uh, it is funny. It is thoughtful it is poignant and it will make you stop and think so glennon was telling a story of when she was 25 years old she was struggling with bulimia uh, she was a drug she was drug and alcohol addicted and she had just found out that she was pregnant and her fear was to kind of leave this captive lifestyle uh, leave those things that kind of allow her to numb herself from the difficulties of life and those the fear of living without you know, the numbness of bulimia, the numbness that the drugs uh, and alcohol gave her in order to live uh, for this child that now she is uh, going to have. So I want to read you uh, some of what she wrote. She says, while I attempt to be uh, to both become a human and grow a human at the exact same ridiculous time, I'm also teaching third grade. By noon each day, I am dizzy with se several sicknesses at once morning sickness, withdrawal sickness, and the sickness of living without a daily escape plan. Each day at noon, I walk my class the long way to lunch so I can peek into my friend Josie's classroom and see the sign hung above her window, which says in big black bold letters, we can do hard things. We can do hard things becomes my hourly life mantra. It is my affirmation that living life on life's own absurd terms is hard. 
It isn't hard because I'm weak or flawed or because I made a wrong turn somewhere. It is hard because life is just hard for humans. And I am a human who is finally doing life right. We can do hard things, insist that I can and should stay in the hard because there is some kind of reward for staying. I don't know what the reward is yet, but it feels true that there would be one. And I want to find out what it is. And I'm especially com com comforted by the we part. I don't know who the we is. I just need to believe that there is a we somewhere, either helping me through my hard things or doing their own hard things while I do mine. I say to myself every few minutes, this is hard. We can do hard things. And then I do them. We can do hard things. You, all of you, all of us can do hard things in this life. We can do them. We can start knocking the section of our wall down that is covered in fear. Some of the hardest fears that we have ever come across in life. And regardless of whether our fears are small or the biggest or scariest, most terrifying ones we have faced, you and I can look those fears straight on and smile tell ourselves we can do hard things and we can knock them down because we know they don't have a hold on us they don't have a hold on us because we were created to be brave and courageous not fear laden cowards so to conclude i want to give you kind of a few ways that we can live fully and courageously so one of the first things that we should do is pray the what ifs away. So one of the first things that Esther did when faced with her incredible fear was she prayed and got as close to God as she could. Not only did she pray, but she invited Mordecai and everyone else to do so at the same time. You see, prayer strengthens our focus and our confidence. In the midst of my own fears, in the midst of those moments in my life when I come up against something that absolutely terrifies me, I pray. And believe it or not, uh, doing this every week still kind of makes me nervous and it gives me a little bit of fear. I don't like preaching to a camera. I can't see you. I can't see your faces. I can't hear the feedback you're giving me. I mean, there's a lot of pressure on what I do. What if I say something dumb and you get a bad image of who God is? What if I don't explain something clear enough? What if, what if my sermons are just, you know, all right, but they're not knock it out of the park awesome? You know, I, I just get nervous thinking about that kind of stuff. So every week I kind of take a giant, big, deep breath and I pray. I pray that God gives me the strength to do this. I, I pray that I am clear. I pray that I can be so transparent that you don't hear me, but you hear exactly what God needs you to hear. And as I pray, it's almost like I can feel all the hesitations and the doubts, the nervousness and fear leave my heart. And it's almost filled with this confidence and peace. All right, number two is give up the comfortable. Sometimes our fear comes because we've gotten stuck into what is comfortable. Therefore, when something challenges that comfort, we don't know what to do. And instead of finding the courage to take on the challenge, we hide underneath the blanket behind those comfortable things. If we look at Esther, she gave up the comfort of the palace to risk her life. This giving up might not be that uh, drastic, but our own giving up might feel that way. Fear says to us, just stick to what is safe, easy, familiar, and comfortable. Courage, courage requires us to give that up because anything we're doing in life will require risk. It will require difficulty, unknown situations, and placing ourselves in uncomfortable moments. Brene Brown, she's a researcher, speaker, and author, and pretty much an all-around fantastic human. She said, I believe that you have to walk through vulnerability to get to courage. Therefore, embrace the suck. In order for us to give up those moments of life that are most comfortable, we have to get a little vulnerable. Embrace the uncomfortable, embrace the suck and the yuck, and move forward as courageously as we can. Number three, we have to see beyond ourselves. In order to live a courageous life and to live in fully who we are, we have to see beyond who uh, we are, right? We have to see beyond ourselves. Esther saw beyond herself. 
If she had failed to go to the king, she not only put herself in danger, but an entire nation of which her family was a part. Esther had shifted from self-preservation to now concern for her people. And once Esther got her eyes off of herself and thought about the greater issue, she found a hidden bucket of courage for speaking boldly to go to the king. When she was worried about her own safety, she was hesitant and fearful. But once her perspective changed, we've talked a lot about that this summer. Once her perspective changed, she rose to the occasion and found the courage to put her own safety on the line. You see, in order to live fully, it will take us looking beyond just us. Esther's courage wasn't just for her, but the entire Israelite nation. When we can step back and see the entire picture, we often can see that our actions impact more than just us. We begin to see that knocking this wall down before us isn't just for us, but it's for everybody who's behind. The last one. You gotta have faith. I was gonna start singing the song, but I thought you probably don't wanna hear that. But you have to have faith. We have to have faith. You see, when fear is permitted to triumph, we surrender the possibilities that lie ahead for us. When fear is permitted to triumph, we surrender the possibilities that lie ahead. When we place our faith in God, we find courage to face the threats and problems that are bigger than we can handle. Because now we're tapped into the only one who can overcome them. Instead of letting her fear paralyze her, Esther allowed it to bring her closer to God and ultimately God's plan for his people. If we want to not let fear control us, and if we want to live fully and have a life of courage, then we have to jump. We have to have faith that God's going to catch us. We have to fly. And we have to take that leap and trust that God is there in the midst of the fear, in the midst of the unknown. One of my favorite poems is by a young girl named Erin Hansen. Well, she's probably not young now, but she was young when she wrote it. Uh, but part of the poem says these words. So there's freedom waiting for you on the breezes of the sky and you ask, what if I fall? Oh, but my darling, what if you fly? So maybe on this morning, God is calling you to take the leap. Maybe God is calling you to look at the challenge that is before you and take that deep breath, to pray, to, to give up the comfort, look beyond your situation and take the leap. So my prayer is that you will seek God, that you will seek him and in him you will find boldness and courage, knowing that the Lord, your God, is with you wherever you go. And yes, you might even ask, but Megan, what if I fall? Oh, but my darling, what if you were put in this very place, in this very moment? to knock the wall of fear down and fly courageously into that new moment of life. Oh, but my darling, what if you fly? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the moments of life where we are put in fearful situations because we ultimately know that in that fearful moment, you will give us the strength and the courage to make it through. Lord, help us this week when we face moments of fear, whether they're small or whether they're really, really big. May you give us the comfort. May you give us the strength and may you give us the courage that we so need keep going and to break through that fear. Father, I know that some, some who are listening this morning are facing an immense amount of fear in their life. And I pray that, that you pour out your Holy Spirit on them. Give them the courage they need. Give them the grace and the love that they so desperately need to be surrounded with. 
Help them, Lord, to knock this wall down that is before them, confidently and boldly and courageously, so that they can step over those bricks one by one by one into a new path, one that is beautiful, and one that is filled with your purpose for their life. Help us to embrace the, the uncomfortable moments to be vulnerable enough to say this scares me to death. But I'm going to trust, God, that you are with me all the way. And in that moment is where I find my courage to take the step forward that I need to take. Lord, help us to do the hard thing. fly. It is in your holy and awesome name that all of God's people said, amen.
uh, fingers crossed that the conversation on Tuesday uh, kind of happens and then we get a good recording from it because I am so excited for what Mary is going to talk to us uh, about with regards to guilt and shame and forgiveness. Uh, she has been an incredible influence in my life already and I, I guarantee that she's going to give you some, some things that you will just sit with for hours and think about. So do not miss uh, these next few weeks. And if you happen to miss them, have no fear because they are held on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page forever and ever. Uh, so until then, I pray that you have an awesome week and I pray that you go in the grace and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ who fills you with immense amounts of courage and strength to knock those walls of fear down in your life. And in that moment when you think you can't do it, just remember that you too can do hard things because you were created to be brave, bold, and courageous. Go in peace and fly this week. Amen and amen. I will see you right here next Sunday at 11 a.m. Have an awesome week. Bye.